Hi everyone. Earlier today I saw my older sister and her family for the first time since last July and there is a lot to be thankful for at this stage as we begin to enjoy more freedom again as we can see things moving in the right direction and yet there is this undercurrent of apprehension in the midst of all that's happened and we must continue to look to God and depend on him for all that we need and all that we long for. Let me begin this time of worship by reading uh, just two verses from Isaiah chapter 40. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart and gently leads those that have young. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will Trust in you alone, and I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home. He guides my ways in righteousness, and he anoints my head. And my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delight And I will trust in you alone And I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me Your goodness will lead And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one. For you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know. And I will trust in you and I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me Your goodness will lead me home God our Father, we come to you as we are, some struggling some glad to be meeting with you, others not so sure, and you know all of that. We come to you because in your kindness and mercy, you created us in your image for friendship with you, to share all that you have made, to know you and glorify you forever. Yet like sheep without a shepherd, we do our own thing under the illusion of self-sufficiency, we find ourselves vulnerable, even lost, far from you and unsure of ourselves. Thank you that you do not write us off, but have sent your Son to be our Good Shepherd, that in him we discover you are with us, seeking us out, drawing alongside, and in his death we see that you're for us, making a way where there was no way, welcoming us in to enjoy life and life to the full. We praise you for Jesus. We thank you that he knows us and that knowing us does not dissuade him from loving us. We praise you for your Holy Spirit, who prays for us when we don't know what to pray and shows us that in Christ we are brothers and sisters, adopted into one family, secure forever. 
as our children and young people prepare to go back to nursery and school for the final term of the strangest of school years, we ask that you would watch over them and that for teachers, you might give them all that they need as they adjust and adjust again. And we remember before you those who are part of this church family who we know are having a hard time or who may well be struggling without our knowing. May they see your mercy and goodness in their lives through Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If I was to ask you what gets you up in the morning, how would you answer? I'm not looking for a strictly literal answer, uh, an alarm clock, the need of the bathroom or caffeine uh, or someone else. Um, what is it that makes life meaningful for you? I guess that's what I'm asking. Not every day delivers on its promise, but what do we hope that life will offer us? And I ask that question knowing fine well that for some that will be an easy question to answer and for others more difficult. For many, lockdown put red tape and restrictions that put a barrier between us and the activities and some of the relationships that have made life meaningful. Now last week we considered the opening verses of the book of Ecclesiastes where the author who identifies themselves as the, the teacher uh, pressed us, pushed us to pay attention to the way things are. And they said that we are breath, mere breath, suggesting that our lives are finite, they are fragile in this world that just keeps on turning. Today, picking up from where we left off, the teacher is going to speak autobiographically, drawing out lessons from their own experience. And this is a, a longer reading, and you may well find it helpful to follow along in your own Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12, reading to the end of chapter 2. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are mere breath, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom much more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be mere breath. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a haram as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labour, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was mere breath, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. 
Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realise that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is mere breath. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is a mere breath, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they have control over all the fruit of my toil to which I have poured out my effort and skill under the sun. This too is mere breath. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labour under the sun. For a person may labour with wisdom, knowledge and skill and then must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is mere breath and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving? with which they labour under the sun. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is mere breath. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is mere breath, a chasing after the wind. Amen. God our Father, help us to be more like children. To have that capacity for wonder, for that curiosity that doesn't tire of asking questions. Forgive us for when we become jaded and cynical, when we act or imagine that we've seen it all, heard it all, know it all. Lord, be our teacher through Jesus Christ. Amen. What gets you out of bed in the morning? I want you to keep that question uh, in your mind as we see what the teacher has to say about their own life and experiences. Now, the teacher, like all the best teachers, is also evidently a, an attentive student, striving to understand. Chapter 1, verse 13, they say, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. We might balk slightly at the scope of their ambition. I mean, our academic system uh, pushes us to know more and more about less and less. And this teacher is the ultimate generalist. They want to make sense of the whole of life. And although that task, in a sense, is impossible to complete, it's not impossible to make a start. And by verse 16, they set out something of their progress. They say, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone else who has ruled in Jerusalem before me. This teacher has done what they can to gain wisdom. They will evidently want to live in harmony with the way things really are. And their conviction that we are breath, mere breath, is not a, an unexamined, untested assumption. It's something they've been willing to, to put to the test. They want to see that, see, amid all the, the possibilities and opportunities of life, whether there is, in fact, something more than that something substantial, something they can take a hold of. That's their quest, that's their pursuit. And the teacher is honest about the pains that have come with growing in wisdom. You know, we sometimes say ignorance is bliss. And certainly it can feel like that as we learn of another impending crisis or uh, a long buried injustice that's come to the surface. You know, things that we wish were untrue. And certainly with wisdom can come tears. You know, when we turn on the light, we don't always like what we see. And we often try and shield and, and protect our children and sometimes ourselves um, from the reality of our big bad world. 
but wisdom, grown-up wisdom, it's not something that, that frees us from disappointment, that keeps things that would provoke us to anger at arm's length. It's the opposite. And sometimes it feels like there's only so much reality we can take. I mean, I know for me that one of my defaults in the face of things that are difficult or painful or when I'm worried about something is that I just look for a distraction. So the phone comes out uh, and I'm scrolling away, listen to another podcast, watch another episode. But this teacher, and this is to their credit, is determined to give themselves wholeheartedly and undistractedly to the pursuit of wisdom. And in the course of that, pursuit, they receive that the wound of knowledge. They discover that wind, wisdom brings sorrow, not respite. It brings grief, not happiness. It shows them the, the cracks and things. As verse 15 says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. And one of the commentators that I was reading on this passage suggests that that verse is really a, likely a, a proverb that they might have used uh, to describe some of their lazier students, you know, obviously beyond the pale. But here they apply it to their own wholehearted, vigorous pursuit of wisdom. What is crooked cannot be straightened, what is lacking cannot be counted. And if this stone-cold, sober approach has done nothing for them but bring grief Perhaps we wonder if there's not an alternative, a better way of trying to get a handle and find meaning in life. You know, is life not for living rather than dissecting? Why shouldn't they get out of their own head? Why not relax, pour another glass, indulge, experiment, accumulate, enjoy, make things happen? And that is what the teacher does. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, documents the teacher's great experiment as they dive into the world of pleasure, as they say yes to things, uh, as they look to laughter and wine, as they uh, take on projects and make plans, as they allow their ambitions to, to take the reins, as they try and be productive, as they grow in prosperity, as they indulge in sex. This is more than just a tentative sip, try before you buy. This is them drinking deeply from all that life can offer. And where does it get them? This is what they say. I became greater than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labour and this was the reward for all my toil. They have it all, they've done it all, they've achieved it all, they have success, they have recognition. From the, the grief of wisdom, they have moved into these experiences of pleasure, delight, achievement, work hard, play hard, have a laugh, make memories. This is what it's all about, surely. And yet, verse 11, suddenly all of that is punctured. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was mere breath, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. The wealth, the pleasure, the laughter, the satisfaction, it was there and it was theirs. It was an effective distraction as far as it lasted. It filled the time, they gave it everything, and yet once more they're left simply uh, grasping at nothing, something they can't quite take a hold of. You know, at each point, it seems that the elephant in the room is the spectre of death. Death is the, the great leveller. Death is the final punchline. You know, at the end of the day, for the teacher or any of us, you know, drunk or sober, wise or foolish, admired or ignored, penniless or prosperous, what difference does it make? You know, the old cliche, you can't take it with you, rings loud and clear as the teacher thinks, well, what actually comes of all that hard work and even the, the apparent successes along the way? And as they think of what it costs them, the, the, the sheer toil, the sweat, 
and the restless worrying that so often follows us home and keeps us awake at night in our beds. And again they find themselves convinced that they are breath, mere breath. And so here we have, have the problem, and it is a problem. All that seems to offer meaning, all that seems to offer happiness, seems somehow to be negated and undone by death. They do great things, but they won't be remembered. They build things and accumulate things, but they can't take it with them. And from this unpromising starting point, the teacher then offers positively their prescription for the good life. This is what we find in chapter 2, verse 24. That's what they say. They say a person can do nothing better than eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. Eating, drinking, working. Three very ordinary, earthy, even necessary activities. Now, perhaps we expect something a little more profound for one who has invested so much in the pursuit of wisdom. Perhaps we expect something a little bit more uh, spiritual. Shouldn't they somehow be reaching beyond those ordinary things? Work, hard work, eating, drinking. So what does the teacher have to say to back up this surprising conclusion? Verse 25, this, this eating, drinking and, and finding satisfaction in working, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat and find enjoyment? So the teacher is starting to see these ordinary things for what they truly are. And the enjoyment that is found through them is seen to be a gift from God, to be received and enjoyed. It's a gift from God that is fitting for God's creatures who are, just as he has discovered, finite, fragile, mere breath. And yet, as those creatures, finite, fragile, mere breath, we're offered this means of grace. But what the teacher shows us is that these ordinary things, so often what happens is we don't receive them as a gift and we don't get to experience the enjoyment that is held out to us in them and through them because we see them only as the means to some other end. And so work and our careers become uh, the way we establish our reputation, how we massage our ego how we display to ourselves and to others that we deserve uh, respect. Our wealth and possessions become a, a scorecard so that we can be sure. Uh, and again, so that everyone is sure that we are somehow winning at life. And our pleasures, uh, the things that we indulge in, our, our exquisite taste experiences, you have to try it. Promise to somehow lift us above the mundane as we search for uh, ever greater heights, a taste of heaven. What about learning? Knowledge. Knowledge as power. Knowledge that somehow promises to give us an authoritative voice so that when we speak, others listen. They sit up, pay attention, respect. And rather than seeing things as they really are, as the teacher has set out for us that we are breath, mere breath, we come to believe I am what I achieve or I am what I possess or I am what I consume. We place the, the full weight of our identity and significance upon something that was never ever intended to bear that weight. Let me just develop one example. Uh, one of the things the teacher talks about is, is the way that they threw themselves into work and industry and productivity. And if you come to believe that you are what you do, you are defined by your work and your function, 
things like job interviews and career progression or the lack of career progression, uh, your professional name and reputation, the opinion of your colleagues and customers, and especially your, your superiors, will have a huge leverage in determining your happiness and your sense of meaning and your sense of worth. And something like a unexpected unemployment or a bad appraisal or even something like retirement, even if it's long planned in advance, may represent a fundamental crisis in your life. But then looking at these things, scrutinising them from the perspective of your deathbed, or even thinking about your legacy post-retirement, may well reveal and expose the futility in all of this. What was it all for? What was at the top of the ladder we were so eager to climb? And even within work, often it's not clear that what we get out matches up to what we put in. You know, it might be that the patient that you patiently and carefully nurse back to health and mobility immediately has another fall. It might be that the technological breakthrough that you invest your life in developing is suddenly rendered obsolete by another innovation. It might be that no one reads or understands or agrees with your university thesis. Those pupils in primary four that you pour yourself into uh, nurturing and challenging and developing might be immediately discouraged in primary five by a jaded colleague who couldn't care less. And even at home, the healthy, nourishing, low-salt, low-sugar, infant-friendly meal you've prepared may well be uh, tossed from the high chair in disgust. You sit and say, well, what was it all for? If you are what you do, if you believe you are what you do, all these things will have a huge bearing on your sense of what life is all about. And the teacher, I think, would change the question. Instead of asking uh, what was it all for, they would say, don't you realise what a gift it is to find enjoyment, to find any satisfaction at all in what you do? Because really we know deep down that, that work, we don't always talk about it in these terms, I mean, work is a, a necessity. But the fact that work can be enjoyable is is a grace, it's a gift. You know, likewise, eating and drinking is necessary. Of course it is. But why does a ripe pear taste so sweet and delicious? Why is the first sip of a cold beer on a hot day uh, just so good? You see, working, eating and drinking are not ultimate things. And when we do make them ultimate things, they can only disappoint. They reveal what they truly are. They are, they are breath, mere breath. You know, when we bracket God out of the picture and look for meaning uh, through the work that we do, we will sooner or later come to conclude, as the teacher does, that it is simply chasing the wind. And workaholics take an extreme case, maybe high achievers. We might uh, respect them, uh, admire them, but filling every waking moment with the next task until that pace becomes at some point unsustainable will not actually make a person uh, more than they are. They will still be uh, human, they'll still be finite, they'll still ultimately be fragile. And it may in fact leave you feeling less than you are. It's like a cog in the machine, a processor. Now, the teacher was not half-hearted in their pursuit of meaning and happiness through work and pleasure and all these things. But all that striving and searching, that great experiment, where did it get them? Well, it brought them to the point where they could see how things really are. And coming to see that um, enjoyment, happiness and joy, and even understanding are not things that can be achieved in the way that you can uh, earn a university degree, go to your graduation. It can't be banked 
like a like a bonus or a dividend. It can't just be ticked off the bucket list, another experience that you simply had to try. Well, happiness, true happiness and joy and understanding are not actually within our reach to take hold of. They slip between our fingers. That's like chasing the wind. It is in fact God who gives understanding and happiness and joy. And these things are not given so that we can be more than human, so that we can make ourselves like God without limits. They are given so that as God's creatures, as those who are inherently dependent and limited, we might find delight, we might find joy, we might find satisfaction in both what is given and the one who gives the gift. In contrast, right at the end of our reading, uh, the teacher names the sinner and they're portrayed as one who, who misses the point, who makes the, the thing that will not last the ultimate thing. And so in the end won't receive what they think they have. They sweat away amassing what they can, possessions, renovating the house, only to end up with nothing. Verse 26, to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over, to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is mere breath, a chasing after the wind. This teacher is very patient, very deliberate. And although at some points we, we want them to hurry up, we want them to tie everything up into neat bullet points, but I hope you're starting to appreciate that in the way that they write about life, they're in fact mirroring life, which is not always set out neatly. And not every question that is raised along the way is neatly tied up with a bow. And if what the teacher has been saying or the way they say it leaves you somehow feeling deflated or heavy, I think part of that is intentional. They're trying to uh, burst some of the, 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 the bubbles that we would uh, build around ourselves. I hope you're starting to see that what they're pointing us towards is something more. Because as they look at life in all its fullness, with its puzzles, with its pains, as they look them full in the face, you might wonder if it would lead them to despair, or at least to desperation. But instead, along the way, they have this taste of something that is good. They see that our lives uh, are like breath. We are dependent, we're finite, we're fragile. So much around us is exactly the same. The things we invest ourselves in, fleeting, passing away. And yet they find themselves receiving this sense of satisfaction and finding joy and pleasure in the midst of it all. You might, I might well ask myself, you know, why, why is it that I can find satisfaction in cutting the grass when I know it's just going to grow straight back? Why does the taste of pizza or wine or the smell of a barbecue not just uh, perform the task of fueling my body, but it makes me smile, it gives me joy? Why are there so many things in life for which uh, honestly and even spontaneously I feel gratitude and to whom do I owe my thanks? Now, the teacher hasn't taken us all the way there yet but I want us to finish with the words of another teacher, the words of Jesus, as he works on a similar theme, as he shows us clearly something of the character of God who gives every good gift. This is from Luke uh, chapter 12, reading from verse 27. Jesus says, consider how the wild flowers grow. And again, Jesus, just like the teacher in Ecclesiastes, is paying attention to the world around them and to the way things are. Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. And if that's how God 
clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. And you do. But seek his kingdom. And all these things will be given to you as well. They are given as a gift. Happiness, wisdom, enjoyment given as a gift from one to whom we owe our thanks. Amen. He sent a son to die and rise again to save us. His never-ending love is steadfast and sure. He's broken our chains and given us freedom. Give thanks to God, for he is good. In him we are alive and have joy everlasting. His never-ending love is steadfast and sure. He casts out all fear and fills us with courage. Give thanks to God, for He is good. When storms come and rage, His peace overwhelms us. His never-ending love is steadfast and sure. The Lord is our refuge when trouble surrounds us. Give thanks to God, for He is good. He's always pouring out His abundant provision. His never-ending love is steadfast and sure. For the depths of His riches and incredible wisdom, give thanks to God. As a final word to us all, let me read to you the charge and the challenge offered by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. <laughs>